the Lenape, who had sort of moved here from New York and Long Island and Manhattan, um, are fusing with other native nations, most prominently probably the Munsi, uh, and they're allied with other groups. And they also allied themselves with the British. Uh, so they're the warriors who fought these American settlers at, at 40 Fort as well, and they win these really resounding and very bloody battles. Hostilities amongst the Indians, between the Indians and the white settlers, uh, between uh, uh, white settlers who laid claim to the same uh, territory, uh, uh, claimed by other white settlers, and between those who were uh, uh, opposed to the British Crown and those who were loyal to the British Crown. And so when the, uh, the Slocums came to uh, the Wyoming Valley, uh, I, they may have done that in order to get away from, the, from the, the actual warfare which was going on in New England, but they could not have picked a worse place at a worse time. Uh, I think that you need to know something about the context, and so that means the, the time and, and the place. Um, the northeastern Pennsylvania uh, was, was really a frontier region. Um, it, it was kind of like the wild, wild uh, west before there was the wild, wild west of cowboys and Indians. Um, and there had been uh, a history of, of violence. Uh, uh, of involving um, different factions of the colonial population. Uh, the Yankee Pennamite War had taken place here between um, uh, Pennsylvania and um, uh, factions supporting Pennsylvania and supporting Connecticut for control of the Wyoming Valley. And, uh, and all throughout uh, colonial history, the, um, the colonial powers, Britain and France, had used uh, Indians, had enlisted Indians in their struggles uh, with each other. The incident that occurred with Francis Slocum was there was an involvement of a lot of things that were going on in that. It was just in the months after the Battle of Wyoming and the Wyoming Massacre and the hostilities between the indigenous population and the settlers from Connecticut were heightened at that point. And also, you had a situation where numerous native tribes were in this area and all seeing it as part of their domain. And obviously, Connecticut settlers were a threat to that. And there had been tensions and hostilities that had been going on since the early 18, or 1750s. So by this time of the Revolutionary War, you have a situation where those hostilities were heightened, especially with the fact that the indigenous population was largely siding with the British. So that sort of brings us to the story of Francis Slocum, who was born in Rhode Island in 1773 to a family of Quakers. So Quakers, if you know anything about them, are pacifists. So we're not 100% certain why they migrated to um, the Susquehanna Valley, uh, other than there was a lot of land, and there's not a lot of land in Rhode Island. The settlers in the Wyoming Valley is, is decimated. Most of them flee to Sunbury, or Point South, or to Easton. And there were only a few stragglers, and among those stragglers were the Slocums, who apparently lived on the outskirts of, of Wilkesburg. Wilkesburg extended to North Street, uh, at that time, and their homestay was just beyond North Street. Um, and on November the 2nd, uh, 1778, uh, three Indians, believed to be Delaware, uh, came to the farmhouse. Jonathan Slocum was not at the farm. But I think it's worth explaining why the Delawares are engaged in this. So this is actually a really old practice for Native Americans living in what is now the Northeast um, and like Eastern Canada. Um, and it's, in English, we, we scholars now call these mourning wars. So people who are in mourning because they've lost loved ones. Uh, so they would raid enemy villages, in this case, settlers. 
um, and kidnap children to physically take the place of people who have died in their families, um, either through warfare or disease or displacement or starvation or whatever the case may be. So there was a lot of history uh, to this. Um, uh, added to, to that was the, um, uh, the terrible population decline that took place among the American Indian populations. Um, and that was mainly caused by the diseases that had been introduced by the Europeans. Um, and uh, one result of that was that the, uh, the Indians uh, became interested in, in captives, um, especially women. Uh, and uh, it wasn't slavery as we think of slavery. They were brought in, they, they could be brought into these, uh, into these Indian nations and become a more or less uh, full members. So uh, Ebenezer's mother, Ruth Slocum, I uh, said, don't take him, uh, he, he's, he's, he'll be of no harm to you, he'll be of no use to you because he's lame for some reason. And instead they took Frances Slocum. She was a child of, of five at the time. And they treated her well, apparently they picked her up like they were the child, but carried her off. So Frances Slocum was given to a Delaware family and she replaced a dead daughter, essentially. She's given a name, and this family raises her. And she disappeared from history for the next 59 years. Uh, legend has it that uh, the Indians stopped at what is now Francis Locum State Park. There was a cave there that's associated with the cave that uh, this party uh, um, spent the night, but I don't know that for sure. We don't even know if they were Delaware. They were probably Delaware uh, because they gave Francis to a, a, an elderly Delaware Indian. She marries this man. Um, he later becomes a chief and sort of by fits and starts they, they sort of migrate to um, around what is now Fort Wayne, Indiana where they essentially start a village that's called Deaf Man's Village. And it's while they're in this village in the mid 1830s. Now, being a captive is vastly different than being a hostage. Immediately after the Battle of Wyoming, George Catlins, the great American uh, a painter who was born in Wilkesburg uh, after the revolution. His mother, Polly Catlin, and her mother were both taken hostage. To be a hostage was basically to be an insurance policy. Uh, you would be taken uh, as far as the first place where the retreating Indians and um, uh, uh, rangers felt safe that there would not be a counterattack. Uh, and apparently, this is very common, there are reports of young girls being taken from uh, Plymouth, uh, but they were released as soon as they got beyond Shawnee Mountain. Uh, and apparently uh, Polly, her maiden name was Sutton, Polly Sutton and her mother, were taken probably maybe to Tunkhannock, maybe a little farther, and were released unharmed. Uh, but if you were taken captive, your fate was very uncertain. Well, the Slocum family comes into this living here in Wilkes-Barre and the Native Americans kidnapped her, removed her from the household in the aftermath of all the tensions at the Battle of Wyoming and eventually she ends up living life with the Indians in Indiana. She, her first husband apparently was rather abusive, but her second husband was a, had a high rank within the native community and was seen as a chief. So she, by this, became a princess. From all indications, she lived a pretty good life as far as um, most of her existence in Indiana. But it was in what is now uh, the state of Indiana along the Wabash. And he meets a woman 
who tells him in Miami, which is the language of the tribe, not to be confused with the place in Florida, uh, it's another Algonquin language, uh, she speaks uh, of Miami, and this particular trader spoke fluent Miami, and she tells him that she was a white girl, and she had been taken captive when she was a little girl, and she lived somewhere along the Susquehanna, and her name was Slocum. Visits are really tense and awkward, um, and her, her surviving relatives are really concerned that she is not a Christian anymore, that she is... For all intents and purposes, she is Delaware or, or Miami. So she remembered that much and was able to recount that. This particular person uh, meets a minister who places a, uh, an article in a paper in, in um, uh, uh, Lancaster County, which is seen by another minister who is familiar with the Slocums. And in, seven, uh, in 1830, Seven, two years after that, uh, s several of the uh, Slocums travel out to the, uh, the Wabash countryside and they meet uh, Francis Slocum. And so in uh, 1831, Andrew Jackson passes the Indian Removal Act, which is supposed to deport all Native Americans living east of the Mississippi River. But what Francis Slocum and some of her supporters, including people from here in Eastern Pennsylvania, um, what they believed is that by sending her west to Indian territory, or what is now Oklahoma, um, that this would lead to some sort of degeneracy, um, that it wasn't right for a white person to spend the, her remaining days among Indians. Um, so they petitioned Congress, and essentially they're, they're allowed by Congress to remain in Indiana. But there were, there were scores to be settled. There were vendettas to be played out. She made a decision that she was going to stay with them. Now, we don't know why she made that decision. There are numerous theories on that the possibility that she wanted to not only protect her tribe, but also made sure that they were not pushed into forced removal, which was the government policy at that time. So uh, it's also possible that she was quite happy in her existence, or if not happy, just that was what she became very accustomed to and wanted to be with people she knew. and would have felt very much like an outsider if she came back to the white community here in the Wyoming Valley. Being the wife of a chief granted her quite a bit of autonomy and power and agency. Um, and so just did her status as a, as a woman, you know, that uh, she was looked on as somebody important in her kinship network and her village. Um, and that this was really important to her as a as a Delaware or a, a Miami woman. So, yeah, she would have been giving up not just the family connections, but the status, the rights, things like that, that came along with being a member of this community. Yeah. What oral narrative does, that's what fairy tales do when I teach the fairy tale class. We can look at what happens to a Cinderella story that's, or a better yet, a Little Red Riding Hood story that started as a folk version in, for uh, working class people, adults, to pass the time. And you've got a Little Red Riding Hood where she's doing a striptease for the werewolf. Uh, and then you get it changed by the time you get to uh, Charles Perrault and, and the French court where you're not going to have a, a young woman stripping for a werewolf and suddenly the, it's a wolf and the wolf is clearly a metaphor but it's a wolf and uh, she is this sort of innocent naive who is preyed upon uh, and victimized uh, but and in the folk version she gets away she strips all her clothes off but then also outsmarts the wolf by saying oh granny I, I, I gotta go and take a leak out outside I can't do it in the bed like you want me to let me out and so she outsmarts the wolf so you get this, these different senses even of uh, once again expectations for young women uh, so we see that in both stories.
I think it, what it comes down to is a question that we all deal with of the familiarity of our circumstances and what our comfort zone is. Obviously, I think if she lived in this area for her whole life, that would have been her comfort zone. And as challenging as it might have been living here, she would have seen other people facing those challenges. And there was a strong communal sense of the people who were settling here because they were rather small in numbers and close by. So she would have had the comfort of that. And as later as the threat from Indian invasion starts to subside as we get past the Revolutionary War, that part of her life could have been beyond her. But it is true that Native women did have a lot of influence and power in their societies um, in ways that American women in the 18th and 19th centuries didn't. Um, so I referenced divorce earlier. The fact that she could divorce her husband was unheard of um, in, in American society. So yeah, returning to being an American uh, at this time would have, you know, really limited her options. There, there's a lot of things that you can make some modern day co correlations to what we think is normal and acceptable, legitimate for today, that wasn't then. I mean, to think about it, right, she had her, her first husband was abusive to him, her, and she was able to get away from him. Probably wouldn't have happened so easily if she stayed in white culture. Yeah, so I can see that. So she was raised in a Lape family as a Lape child. She was expected to learn how to do everything a boy could do, everything a girl could do. She was self-sufficient. She had a family around her that loved her. She had a community around her that loved her. She had a voice in her government. She could essentially vote. She could be the leader of the community, the Sakima, the chief if she wanted to. And she had the skills for it. You have to have skills for it. <clears throat> she could marry, decide how many kids she wanted. She could grow old knowing the people around her would help take care of her and she would never be alone in life. She would have a long life compared to the settler women. Um, the settlers could beat their wives, sell their wives, do anything they wanted to to their wives. And it was okay because the wife was property. Children were property too. So her life was better and easier. Once Europeans started arriving, however, um, in the 1600s on the East Coast, all of this starts to change. And we know, for example, um, that more and more people started flooding into the Wyoming Valley, especially at the start of the 1700s, as a way of escaping like all of the pressures that colonization brought with it. So, for example, um, the Lenape set up permanent settlements along the Susquehanna, as did the Muncie. Um, I think an interesting thing that becomes part of the Francis Slocum story is that it fits into kind of a narrative of the, the tremendous challenges that the Connecticut Yankee settlers had to face when they were here in the Wyoming Valley. and. You know, you're talking about not only involved in battle with the native population along with the enemy, the British, but also the very challenge of eking a living out of the land here. Now, on one hand, it was a logical place for them to settle because it was seen as part of Connecticut and also because of the fact that it had pretty rich alluvial soil along the Susquehanna Plain. The downside, of course, was the challenges to the natives who saw them as invaders, and also any connection with Connecticut. This was a really isolated place in the late 1700s. This was the frontier. And once you got beyond a little bit of a comfort zone, maybe in the valley, 
the weather and the soil was not real favorable in a lot of other places. Um, what we think is that it was inhabited mostly by people who we now call the Delawares or the Lenape. Uh, there are also other groups like the Munsi who are also really prevalent here. Um, and then we know that the Wyoming Valley more generally was used as a trade corridor, so people would move north and south through the Wyoming Valley, the Lackawanna Valley, um, to get to other places to trade. Um, so there are there's some archaeological evidence that you know suggests there were some permanent settlements here by the 15 and 1600s. I think there are a lot of ways in which Francis Slocum's story would not have been as appealing to you know the British colonials and then the early Americans uh, because it sort of validates the enemy, if you will, and, and sort of uh, that the, the captivity narrative has spent a lot of time. And again, I'll go back. I'll go 200 years back in the past to um, Mary Rowlandson, but. She lived with these people for 11 weeks, I think it was, and uh, had different masters, and her one master was kind to her, and she said he was the best friend I ever had of an Indian, um, was able to differentiate between this wife treated me well, this wife was a proud woman and treated me poorly, and yet despite that, the kind of uh, descriptors she finds to talk about her captors. They are hellhounds, they're savages, uh, they're, they're brutal and heathens. All, all this language tells us something about the perspective on the Native Americans. Uh, the tribe that she was living with, it sometimes had been described that they were living a higher standard of living than many of the white settlers that were in that area. So when she eventually had contact with her family, she was totally assimilated into the native life, did not understand English, and seemed quite comfortable and happy with it. Uh, in, in 1775, uh, the American Revolution erupts uh, first in Massachusetts, uh, and it um, it spreads its way down uh, the uh, the eastern seaboard, and uh, and the the fighting uh, becomes very ferocious in Pennsylvania. Uh, and just months before um, Slocum's uh, abduction, uh, there is a, a major battle, and it, it's sometimes called a battle, and it's sometimes called a, a massacre, uh, the the Battle of Wyoming or uh, or the uh, Wyoming Massacre. Uh, in which um, uh, the uh, American forces uh, were were utterly destroyed by um, by a larger British force uh, consisting of um, Indian allies, mainly I believe comprised of of uh, members of the Iroquois uh, Federation, but possibly also some uh, Leni Lenape. And it seems like this is what the Wyoming Valley was was used for that at certain times different groups would use the Wyoming Valley as a way to escape these pressures um, even if it was just temporarily like a season or two so by the 1720s or 1700s rather that starts changing where, where these native groups are seeking some escape from colonizing. For the Puritans, uh, there were dark things in the woods and the devil may be lurking in the woods. Uh, that's in a lot of ways what was going on with the witch trials too, sort of preying on that belief. So yes, certainly, certainly these tales uh, told especially from the white perspective are going to reinforce our perspective, which by and large was not very positive about the Native and that to hear, uh, certainly you can, I'm sure, still hear contemporary recountings of Frances Slocum and her experience that will vilify the, the natives who took her. Um, and again, well, there's no doubt for a five-year-old child that was going to be a traumatic experience. And she, she was welcomed into that tribe, she was acculturated, she chose not to leave later. Uh, so she clearly came to see them with different eyes.
And also what's neat too is locally in the archives of the Historical Society, you can find wonderful family reunion photos of the Slocum family going forward. And there's this fantastic one, I'm going to guess around 1910, where it's 50, 60 people, but the dress goes from normal Western dress, sorry, what we call normal, um, to Indian headdress with the, with the feathers, and they're all Slocums. And so they kept having these reunions over and over again, and they would always get published in the local Wilkesbury papers because there's still people around with the last name Slocum, and, it, and um, they kept just the story going.